Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles. Use the chapter titles to guide you to the section you'd like to jump to. Click on the gear icon to speed up or slow down the playback speed. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, I have two finished projects, and I have some freshly spun yarn to share with you. So let's get started. This first tidbit is just an announcement about an article I have in the latest issue of Interweave Knits. It's the summer 2022 issue, and on the cover you'll see a little, I don't know, whatever they're called, that lets you know something about what's inside the magazine, and it says, Manage Yarns in Stranded Color Work, page 40. The article is about handling the yarns in stranded color work using parallel floats, versus rotating floats. Now, I did a video on this topic a few years ago. I think it was in 2018. I'll leave a link down in the show notes and up at the top of the screen in case you missed it and would like to see that. Parallel floats and rotating floats are two different ways of managing the yarns when doing stranded color work like this. These two different methods produce slightly different results on the front and the back of the work. Both are equally valid methods. One is not better than the other. And as a knitter, you get to choose whichever method works best for you and your knitting and the result that you would like to see. So with parallel floats, there's an effect called yarn dominance. The yarn that runs along the bottom, that's, they're, para, para, they're called parallel floats because the two yarns are running in parallel on the back of the work. The yarn that is carried along the bottom is going to create larger stitches than the yarn that runs along the top. So there's this oft-repeated claim that the effect of these larger and smaller stitches is the result of poor tension, and that is just flat out wrong. Inconsistent tension between the two yarns can reduce or increase the amount of dominance that you see in your finished fabric. With rotating floats, there is no yarn dominance. All the stitches are exactly the same size. True fair aisle knitting, which is a subset of stranded color work, requires parallel floats. It's part of the knitting tradition. The background color is the non-dominant color, the one that will have smaller stitches, and the foreground color is the one that's going to have dominance. Now, other knitting traditions may use and often do use a combination of parallel and rotating floats depending on which one is more convenient to the knitter and wh what effect the knitter wants to achieve. So if you're interested in reading the article, I I'll leave a link down, down below. Interweave Knits is available in print format or digital format. Now, in the past, my articles have been featured as an interweave blog post at some point soon after publication, but I haven't yet heard anything about whether or not that's going to happen with this article. And I'll also leave a link to my playlist on color work videos that I have on my channel where you can find um, all the videos I've done on color work, whether it's stranded or some other type of color work. Um, and that playlist also includes some Casual Friday videos where I was exploring this topic back in 2018. This tidbit came to me on Instagram um, through a DM from Alex. If you have ever gone to a needlework related event, wherever it is that you live in the world, you'll have some idea uh, about how vendors are set up, what sorts of vendors you'll see, what sorts of, of uh, environment will be. Sometimes these places have classes, things like that. The tidbit that Alex sent me is a link to a YouTube video on Franklin Habits YouTube channel. He moved to Paris fairly recently. I think it's been in the past year or two, some point during the pandemic. And he's been vlogging about his experiences. His most recent vlog is called Paris Celebrates the Needle. 
and it's a it's a big needlework show that they they previously had every year. I think it, this is the first time they've had it since the pandemic. And his video is about his experience going to this needlework show in Paris. It's on the outskirts of Paris and seeing what sorts of things are sort of very familiar to the experience of an American needlework show. And then what sorts of things are different, particularly uh, when it came to specific yarns that would have been available from smaller producers in in France. So you're going to see different types of yarns in different types of countries. It sounds like there were also some areas of needlework that were represented at this show that maybe you wouldn't normally see at an American fiber show. So I'll leave a link to his vlog down below in the show notes. For me, it's, it's just really fun to have that sort of vicarious pleasure of seeing um, all of the things that are available at a show like this in a different place. If any of you know of videos of fiber shows or needlework shows in other countries outside of the US, I would love to see those. You can send them to a link to those videos to me in an email. You can try leaving it in a comment. YouTube tends to delete comments that include links even to other YouTube videos. I don't know why they do that. I don't have any control over it. I'm supposed to have control over it, but I don't. Or you can send me a direct message in uh, Ravelry if you've got a link like that. But I'd love to see what fiber shows and needlework shows are like in other countries around the world. This tidbit came to me on Twitter. Dr. Alexandra Macon is presenting an online lecture through the San Francisco School of Needlework and Design on July 13th. The lecture is called Studying the Making of the Bayou Tapestry. So I've talked about the Bayou Tapestry before. Technically, it's not really a tapestry. It's just a very, very large embroidery and it's housed in the Bayou Museum in France, but it was originally created in England. But the subtitle for this uh, lecture is The Front Tells the Story, The Back Tells the History, what the reverse of the Bayou Tapestry can tell us. So I wasn't really sure what the reverse of the tapestry can tell us meant. So I kept reading and the description of the event, I saw this paragraph, uh, which says, this presentation will take us into the world of the Bayou Tapestry, but with a twist. We will focus on the reverse of this famous hanging, exploring what it tells us about how it was made by analyzing the order of the work and how the threads were used. We will learn about the creation and thought processes of the embroiderers. We will also explore how the workers were organized as stitchers and what this tells us about the production of embroidery in 11th century England. You can register for this lecture via Eventbrite and I'll leave that link down below. There is a cost. Uh, of $10 for this. And again, it's going to be on July 13th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And I will also leave a link to Dr. Macon's Twitter account as well in case you're interested in seeing what she's up to. This tidbit came to me on Instagram from a user called Nana. As many of you probably know, I have an interest in vintage knitting patterns, particularly sweater patterns. It's all part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. So I was really excited to see the link that Nana sent me, which is to the Sirdar website. And I have used Sirdar patterns many times, uh, particularly in my early years of knitting. I think I used a lot of their children's patterns when my niece and nephew were small and my kids were little. They have available on their website what they call the Sirdar Heritage Collection. They've digitized patterns from the 1930s all the way up to the 1990s, and those patterns are now available for download from their site. Some of the patterns are free, um, but others cost a little bit. I think $3 is pretty standard. I don't know if, they, if there's anything in between that. It seems like 
it's either zero or three dollars. So given that these are vintage patterns, they were scanned as is, they might have wrinkles in them, um, but and they also have not been updated in terms of contemporary sizing and presentation. So they do include this disclaimer. We're excited to open and share our design archive for everyone to explore and enjoy as an uncensored reflection of Sirdar design history, our heritage collections may not reflect our current values and ongoing commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So for example, uh, the pattern that I'm showing you here is from the 1950s for a twin set, and it's made from their majestic two-ply yarn, and the gauge for that would have been eight to eight and a half stitches per inch. Um, and it's available in only three sizes, uh, 32, 34, and 36 inch busts. I'll leave a link below to the Sirdar Heritage Collection portion of their website down in the show notes. If you'd like to contact me with tidbits that you have come across that you think might be interesting to other people who view this podcast, you can direct message me on Ravelry or you can send me an email at knits at gmail.com. And that email address is also uh, listed on the About page of my YouTube channel. Oh, I forgot to mention this at the top of the podcast, but I received a gift from a viewer Last week, when we got back from our road trip, it was waiting for me at my post office box. And so I opened it up. I want to go to the overhead and show you what was inside because I had no idea what was in store for me. So let's see what is in this package. A gift for me. Hope you enjoyed this small gift being sent as a thank you for the time and effort you put into sharing your knowledge with the knitting community. You are very much appreciated from Kathy. Well, Kathy, thank you so much. What is this? Oh, cool. This is so cool. I always love sharing artwork, like pieces of art that, that depict people knitting. And this is, oh my God, this is fantastic. Look at some of these old photographs. Oh. oh, and Sojourner Truth, one of my favorite pictures of a knitter. Oh, these are fantastic. Thank you so much, Kathy. This is amazing. Oh, this is fantastic. So let's see who, this is called People Knitting, A Century of Photographs. This looks like it was collected by Barbara Levine. Oh my gosh, this is great. They date from the 1860s to the 1960s. They comp come primarily from her personal collection of vintage vernacular photographs. This is wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathy. This is, this is amazing. I love this. This is one of those things where it's like the perfect gift that you didn't know you uh, wanted. So uh, I love this. I love this. Thank you so much. This is a little baby sweater I started about a month ago. And then in the casual Friday from two weeks ago, I was waiting to receive some buttons I'd order. And then we went on a road trip um, and just got back at the end of last week, which is why there was no casual Friday last week. The pattern for this little sweater is called Lily Dahlia Solo. And there are actually four different garments in this particular pattern. There's a sweater, the sweater, there's a short sleeve pullover, a dress, and then there's a little romper that snaps at the crotch. And they all start with this yoke pattern and they're all worked top down. So I, each of the garments I think comes in five sizes. I know the sweater does. So five sizes starting with newborn and this is the second size that I knit. Uh, I didn't knit the smallest size. Uh, and also, the this sweater pattern is available for larger size children as a separate 
purchase. So you can get this sweater pattern for a larger child if that's something that you're interested in. The yarn I use is called Sun Valley Fibers MCN, which is merino cashmere nylon and it's in a fingering weight. Now the label says 400 yards in a 100 plus gram skein. And what that actually turned out to mean was that, you know, it was a four ounce skein. So the skein weighed like 113 grams. So it's a four ounce skein. And I had a very, very tiny amount of it left after I finished this. So last time I talked a little bit about some confusion I had at first with the way that the chart for this little leaf pattern was presented which ultimately I think came down to a cultural difference in charting conventions. There, there just isn't a universal standard for how knitting patterns are charted. And in this case, the designer is Danish. So one of the commenters to my last video is Danish and they said the designer is well known in Denmark for having excellent patterns and that there's nothing particularly odd about how that chart was presented based on what they're used to. So while these kinds of things can kind of stop me in my tracks for a little while until I sort out what is intended versus how I interpreted the instructions, in the end, I, as long as I learn something new, I'm happy. And then that gives me more context for the next time I might come across uh, a chart that is a little different than what I might expect or be used to. So I'm pretty pleased with this sweater. Uh, before I send it off to my college roommate, this is for her grandbaby to be, I probably will be using it in additional videos. I think it's the only yoke sweater that I actually have in the house at the moment and so I, I just started doing a series of technique videos on sweater styles and explaining the differences in how they're constructed and what defines different types of sweater styles. So I will probably be uh, using this sweater as an example in when I get to the video um, on yoke style sweaters. So expect to see this again in the future. So I always like to have some knitting when I'm on a road trip and it needs to be something small, something not too intricate, something I can, I can knit more or less without constantly referring to the directions. So I had pretty much finished the knitting on the sweater before I left. And so I took um, the yarn to make this hat for my brother. It's the 1898 hat. I've knit this hat a number of times. I hardly ever knit the same pattern more than once. This has got some really ingenious things about the construction. I'd actually knit this hat once before for my brother, <laughs> but after three years of wearing it, it had gotten a little loose. And so he thought, well, I'll just throw it in the wash and see if I can tighten it up. And it's not a super wash wool. It's a merino. And so it felted into a very tiny, um, thing. So I did buy him some unicorn wool wash and wool rinse and explained to him at the end of the season, wash your hat, hand wash your hat. And I really like unicorn for that, for the purpose of actually washing something to get dirt out because it does a really excellent job. Eucalyan, those no rinse wool washes are nice for the first wash after, you know, for blocking and for freshening something up. But I feel like if you really have dirt in it, Unicorn um, d does a really good job of actually pulling the dirt out and suspending it in the water. And then you rinse the garment afterwards in their fiber rinse, which, um, returns it to the proper pH level, gives it a little bit of acidity that, that Wool really likes. Since I was going to re-knit this, I decided to make a change to it to make it an even better hat. So the hat is called the 1898 hat by Kristen Burns. It's a free pattern published in the Siemens Church Institute Christmas at Sea download booklet. Um, and it's available on their website, which I will leave a link to down below. The yarn that I use is called Shepherd's Wool Worsted and it's from Stonehenge Fiber Mill. And they're a small mill in Michigan. That's where my brother lives. So the first hat that I made was from this exact yarn. He and my sister-in-law had been to a fiber show and they came across 
the Stonehenge booth and he really liked this yarn. And I said, well, buy it and I'll make a hat from it. So this time I went to, I had to order it from their website and I decided, well, I'm going to order a, a coordinating color and make the crown of it double thick, which is not something I'd done uh, the first time around. So I'm going to go to the overhead and I want to talk a little bit about some of the techniques that I used for this hat. So I've actually got two 1898 hats here. This is the one I just knit and this is one I knit for myself a few years ago. So there, there's a couple of differences. The original hat has you create this garter stitch band that go that you're, you're knitting in this direction all the way around into a strip that you then uh, connect together. And it's double wide. This portion right here are slip stitches that are in the middle, like where my two pinkies are touching. Those would be like the slip stitches. So when you get the entire thing done, it's folded in half like this. And so the two selvages are along this edge right here. And what the pattern is telling you to do is to pick up between both selvages. So you, you decide this is the right side of the work and you pick up stitches um, underneath both of the selvages. So the result is that on the inside of the work you have, you can see both selvage stitches along here. And then when you knit the crown of the hat, you're just knitting a regular hat crown single layer what where this is double layer and it is garter stitch so what i wanted to do for my brother's hat was to create double layer for the crown as well this wasn't something i'd done the first time but it's something that i noticed over the years after making this hat a few times so that this is so nice and warm but this part isn't as warm so you can see on the inside I have a second hat crown in here that appears as stockinette when you look at it. And what you see along the edge here, it's a little easier to see on this side of it because of the difference in the colors, is that when I had that hat band and it was folded like this, rather than selecting to pick up stitches from the right side of the hat through both of the selvage stitches, instead, I picked up from the inside of how of, of that folded hat band. So I picked up from the wrong side or the inside of this hat band through one selvage stitch. And then I picked up all the way around the hat. And so when I got to the last, I picked up the last stitch and I had the first stitch over on this needle, I had the wrong side of the hat band facing me. So I did a wrap and turn around that first stitch. I just wrapped it just like you would for a short row turn if you were doing wrap and turn short rows. So I wrapped that stitch, put it back on the left hand needle, and then I turned the work so that the right side was facing me and then I knit the hat crown. And what that did was it put this slip stitch selvage facing the right side of the work so that it becomes a decorative element that separates the garter stitch area from here. And then when I wanted to knit the second crown of the hat, I had only picked up through one of those selvages, so now I picked up from the wrong side of the other selvage. And I did the same thing, I picked up all the way around, and then when I got to the last stitch, I, I took my working yarn and wrapped it around the first stitch, and then turned the work so that the side was facing me, I could see the selvage stitch, and then I could knit the second a crown of the hat. In order to deal with yarn tails, what I did was when I got up to where the decreases were in the second crown, I wove in all of the ends. I had access to all parts of the hat. I wove in all the existing tails, and then, then I worked the decreases for this second crown here. I fastened off um, the live stitches and then when I, in order to weave in the yarn tail, after I wrapped around here, I, would, I took the yarn tail up one leg of each stitch in one particular column for a little bit until I have, had a span of knit stitches. And then I just used a technique called duplicate stitch, which is normally used to cover up mistakes or it's used in a contrast color as an embroidery technique. Um, but in this case, it, since it was in the same color, 
I could just follow the path of all of the stitches using duplicate stitch in order to weave in the end and then I could stick the tail in between the two layers uh, and cut it and then all of the tails were hidden away so you don't see any yarn tails uh, on the front or the back side of this particular work. The month of June was really about keeping myself distracted and keeping my hands busy uh, while dealing with the aftermath of my mother's death at the end of May. So I needed to work on small projects that I could, that weren't too complicated and that I could just send out into the world, um, like the baby sweater for my college roommate's grandbaby to be and my brother's hat. And this week I felt the need to return to my spinning wheel. So years ago, uh, I was, there was a woman in a knitting group that I was part of who had a small sheep farm. Uh, so she was a knitter and a spinner and a dyer. I, she may even have been a weaver as well. I'm, I don't quite remember. Um, but I was not a spinner at the time and I didn't have any intention of becoming one. But I remember her saying that spinning was something that she could do at the end of the day when she was brain dead. That knitting required more focused attention for her, but spinning was something that she could just do on autopilot. And so this past week, I wasn't quite ready to return to the sweater project I'd put to the side at the end of May, but I was really in need of just doing something that felt kind of meditative. So I had four ounces of natural colored, not cream color, but like different colors of brownish gray that I needed to spin up. Um, it was part of a kit um, that I'd received from Paradise Fibers a few years ago that had four ounces of cream color BFL silk and four ounces of this natural colored fiber. And earlier this year, I had spun the cream colored and I just hadn't gotten around yet to the natural colored uh, wool yet. So I sat down and I uh, worked on that for a while each day this past week and it really helped uh, to just kind of calm me and give me that sort of meditative feeling where I didn't really have to think at all. So let me just show you the two yarns. So this is the, the BFL silk that I had spun a few months ago. And then this is the yarn that I just spun this week. So this is a three ply. And so there are areas that were kind of creamy color and some that were darker and some that were kind of medium. And then when you ply them all together, they get a little bit more homogenous looking, but there's still flecks of color. It looks almost more marled than it does anything else. So I'm just, I, I'm never sure what to do with the yarn that I have spun. This is actually pretty decent yarn. So I've got eight ounces of it. I'm thinking it's somewhere around a DK to worsted weight. I haven't tried swatching with it at all yet. One thing I'm considering doing is just treating it as some sort of an experiment. A while back, I bought this die kit from Clemis and Clemis, and I haven't done anything with it. And I was thinking that it might be interesting to dye both of these skeins uh, in the same dye bath and see what happens because I don't know what would happen. And I'm, I'm curious if any of you have done this kind of thing before. So this is, um, BFL was silk, and so it's got more of a sheen. I would expect it to take the color a little bit differently than it, just a plain BFL. And then this has got the natural uh, color, so it's gonna, it would come out darker. And I'm just wondering, I'm just, I'm just wondering uh, if any of you have done that, if you've got any, or any advice on that, on like how, how to dye something like that. I Again, I don't know what I would do with the yarn once it's done. And so it might just be an experiment to see what happens and not just, just not worry about what I'm going to knit with it, if anything. But let me go to the overhead again one more time and then I'll just show this to you a little bit um, more up close. This skein of yarn right here is a BFL silk blend. So it's got a bit of a sheen. And then this one is just BFL. So this is natural colors. And uh, I had, I, this is a three ply. So I had three 
uh, sets of singles that I plied together. I had four ounces of each one. I think they're pretty close to being about the same <laughs> yarn weight. I was not trying to be in any way technical when I was knitting this. So, um, so these are the two yards. So I imagine that this could be really interesting when it's dyed. Obviously, it would end up being somewhat tonal, and then the, the, the natural color under there is going to affect it as well. So if I were to put both of them in the same dye bath, this one's going to be uh, lighter in color than this one, and this is probably going to have a bit of a sheen. The silk might cause it to take up and reflect the dye differently. So I just need to figure out if, if it's a good idea or not. Uh, to try dyeing them both at the same time. And then once I did that, what would I do with eight ounces of this? I think this is probably a DK to worsted weight um, yarn. I haven't tried knitting with it at all yet to see for sure, but that's, that's my guess. It's very squishy. The BFL is uh, very squishy and it has a certain you know, amount of give to it. It's got some boing to it um, as well, but it's very squishy when I squish it in my hands. So I quite like it. I just don't know what I'm going to do with it. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.